Welcome to Sputnik, orbiting the world with me, George Galloway. And me, Gayatri. When I first took my seat in Parliament almost 30 years ago, the House was full of characters, men and women of independent mind, the content of whose speech could not be predicted as they rose to give it, whose vote could not be guaranteed by the political machine, and who wouldn't have dreamt of being told what to say by pager as they quaintly called them in those days. We had no mobile phones, no internet, no emails. Even the facts had not been invented, and it is long since dead. It was easier, to be sure, to make up your own mind in those days. Nowadays, there are precious few politicians who stand out from the crowd as people of integrity, who say what they mean and mean what they say. Whether you agree with them or not, you can respect them for that. Our first guest, stands sentinel over these old traditions, the son of a peer and editor of the Times when that title meant something, and the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset, Jacob Rees-Mogg. Jacob, thanks for joining Thank us. You. Let's uh, cut to the chase on that point. Uh, being the editor of the Times isn't what it used to be. Being a Member of Parliament isn't what it used to be. Why do you think that decline has occurred. Well, I wonder whether this is true or whether this isn't something that people have always said throughout the generations. Uh, there's a great line in Boswell's Life of Johnson when Dr. Johnson, who's a friend of Edmund Burke, among others, complains that there are no proper issues and statesmen as there were in the reign of King Charles I. And if you, <laughs> if you think of the people who Johnson knew and was dealing with, who we now look back on as amazing and important figures, I just wonder if this isn't just part of the natural tide of history, that you look back at people and see their successes and forget that actually when you were first elected 30 years ago, there'd have been some pretty boring speeches in the House of Commons, but those are forgettable, and you put those to one side and remember the great events. I, I thought that you might answer uh, thus, uh, and it's gallant of you to do so, but there are some things which can't be denied. Uh, you may or may not know, but the music of the 60s and the 70s, the popular music of the 60s and the 70s, is seen as a golden age, objectively. Nothing quite like it in a decade or 15 years uh, has ever been seen since. Harold Wilson's cabinet had 10 people in it who could have been prime minister in the afternoon, and most of them were trying to be. Uh, there are objective truths, I think, in this, that the in a parliament where ideology uh, is less important, where party management and machine politics more salient, it must be true, mustn't it, that the number of members of parliament like you, one of the Tories' most uh, rebellious members, but in any case, one who's, I think, universally seen as someone who genuinely tells you what they think rather than what someone told them to think, uh, it, it must be a decline, surely. I don't think so. If you look at um, voting patterns in the last parliament, 2010 to 2015, uh, it was the most rebellious parliament post-war, and the parliaments in the 50s and 60s had hardly any rebellion against party whips, so that um, instead of people becoming less independent-minded, they become more uh, independent-minded. I, I think there is an area where we could agree and that is over the approach taken by New Labour, which I think was very controlled. It was very successful, but it was very controlled, and people had to fit in with the discipline that was imposed, or else uh, they were essentially sidelined, possibly even removed. And I don't think that was good for politics, but I think it's opened up again since. I used to sit with people whose pockets would buzz. Younger viewers will not know, but there was a thing called a pager, and someone sent you what they called in the Blair days the line to take. And you'd see members simultaneously reach into their pocket and read what they were supposed to be shouting uh, across at the opposition or what they should say if they caught the uh, speaker's eye. I take your point about the votes. I knew that statistic, but somehow... The speeches, the arguments, seem less important so, in, they sound in robotic, Parliament at today. least. From, as, as he says, following a line. But I think you've got to compare this with the run of the mill uh, of the speeches 30 years ago. That not every speech made 30 years ago was Enoch Powell standing up to say to Margaret Thatcher, 
I asked the Right Honourable Lady what metal she was made of, and I have had the response back from the scientists, and they say it's titanium-plated steel. Those are sort of incredible moments, were very much one-offs. And now we do have our moments. Um, um, Hilary Benn's speech on the Syria debate, I mean, you wouldn't have agreed with any of it, but it was a quite remarkable parliamentary occasion. And yes, of course we have uh, routine speeches about less exciting subjects uh, that are fully in line with, with party policy. Um, but then you get yesterday, Crispin Blunt saying that um, he took, he took poppers. poppers. Yeah. Um, Pop, which my eyes popped. Of course, some confusion, because most of us thought they were those party <laughs> things that you get flying about at Christmas and didn't realise that it had that's other right. connotations. That's right. Um, Indeed. Uh, now, that's a fair point. Let's talk then about the great issues, because uh, in Look Back in Anger, Osborne uh, has his character complain that there are no great issues issues, which is bunkum, of course. There have been great issues every year uh, since. The great issue now yawning in front of us is the European Union. Mm -hmm. It's my thesis that we could be seeing, with the Corbyn-led Labour Party, with a couple of hundred MPs disaffected from him, and a clear big cleavage on the European issue in the Conservative Party and now minuscule Liberal Democrat uh, group, that we may see a realignment of British politics around this issue. I'll be with you campaigning to withdraw uh, from the European Union for different reasons, no doubt. Uh, do you see Europe as a defining issue that's going to have a lasting impact on the British political scene? I think it's a crucially important issue and the decision that we're about to make is going to determine Britain's place in the world for the next couple of generations. So it's very important in that yeah. uh, context. I, I think we should be bold, stand up for ourselves and vote to leave. I think the renegotiation is essentially an irrelevance uh, and that the time has come to make the big decision. And there are so many opportunities for us if we do that in countries that we deal with, the relations we can develop, the trade we can do. I think it's very positive uh, if we decide to do that. In terms of party realignment, um, it's very interesting looking at your old party, that I have a feeling that if it weren't for what happened in the early 1980s, the scars of the SDP experience, the Labour Party would be looking at a realignment, that there is grave dissatisfaction of the parliamentary party with the leader who has the support of the party in the country. But because of the memories of what happened in 1981 and onwards, and that that led to a very long period in office for the Conservatives, I think there's a deep hesitancy to take the steps towards the realignment. So I'm, I'm not sure there will be any big change in the party political functions uh, uh, over the coming months or what years. What about though in the Tories? It's said that up to 70% of Tory MPs will support withdrawal, whilst the government and the government machine will, of course, be campaigning for remaining in the European Union. Will that be a lasting cleavage or easily papered over? Well, you mentioned Harold Wilson, how he managed to run a cabinet with a dozen people in it who thought they could be prime minister. And he, as a party manager, was a quite remarkably successful individual. Let's leave aside, leave aside what he did in terms of running country because we're not going to agree on his successes on that. But I think we can agree that as a political manager he was a genius. And I think David Cameron has learned a great deal from that. Uh, and by offering the referendum and by suspending collective responsibility, he set in place the groundwork for the party to be united after the referendum is out of the way. And I think that's very important. I think it's very beneficial for conservatism and it will then depend on who succeeds him and whether the person who succeeds him wishes to continue in the same mould or decides to lay down the law on the European issue, which would be very uh, damaging. But I think David Cameron's been very, very clever and astute about this. You don't think that there will be those who would be king or queen uh, who would use a defeat for David Cameron? Because don't forget, in the course of the referendum, he's going to have to be stronger and stronger and stronger in support of remaining in. And the stronger he gets in favour of staying in, if he loses, the greater the political damage to him might very well be. And there will be some, we can name two or three already, uh, who think, well, I'd like to succeed and now is the opportunity 
to strike. You don't see the possibility of David Cameron being defenestrated over this? No. Oddly, I think his position is in some ways better if he loses than if he wins, because the people who are in favour of leaving will be bitterly disappointed, in the country at large, I'm not going to say much about members of parliament, will be bitterly disappointed if we don't, and may then look at what he said and say, oh, the Prime Minister was too aggressive, he took too great a lead in this, that uh, his positions were unfair, it gave the in-campaign an unfair advantage. Whereas if he loses and he says afterwards, OK, I've listened to the country, that's my job now is to get the best deal we can as we leave the EU, I'm absolutely up for it, and let's bind things together. The people who wanted to leave will be delighted by the result and I think will be very willing to say, well, that's fine, you, you've accepted the situation and now let's rally behind you. I oddly think the difficulty uh, is if he wins and you may find that there is some underlying resentment uh, about the result. You said uh, at the time, didn't you, that, uh, that the Conservatives should make an arrangement with UKIP. Do you hold to that? Um, very interestingly, the election result seemed to show more Labour voters going to UKIP than Conservative voters. Uh, I thought a, a deal would have helped us win the last election. We were then able to win it on our own because the opinion polls turned out to be wrong. Where I think UKIP's been successful uh, is in appealing to disaffected Labour voters who probably are striving and wanting to improve their lives, don't view themselves as natural Tories, but quite like some of the bolder patriotic messages uh, that UKIP's giving. And that may be a section of old Labour voters who are uh, appealed to by Nigel Farage, um, possibly some of whom Margaret Thatcher appealed to, but that currently the Conservative Party doesn't. So I think we can certainly learn from UKIP, uh, even if a formal pact was something before the last election rather than relevant for today. Jacob Rees-Mogg, thanks for coming Thank you. on the Sputnik. Coming up next, from an English grandee to a Palestinian one, the Lord of the Manor of Shoot. Don't miss it. Welcome back to Sputnik. The huge Palestinian population which stood fast in the upheaval of 1948 when Palestine was wiped off the map and Israel replaced it has been all but invisible for 60 years, even for someone like me who has specialised in the subject almost all of my life. In fact, I know only one such Israeli Arab and he's with me now. He's a fascinating, charismatic individual, and he has emerged as quite a player in London. A football agent, a successful lawyer, a benefactor to every good cause, and an honorary lord. He is Lord Karalla of the Manor of Shoot. Abdul Halim, welcome on board the Sputnik. Let's get the nomenclature right from the start. Are you an Israeli Arab or are you a Palestinian? I think I'm Palestinian and I'm an Arab and I have Israeli passport. I, I think these titles cause me a lot of problems in our life. Tell me. Because <clears throat> this identity issue, we live it and we always struggle with it. Because <clears throat> I was born in Yaffa and Kufur Qasim. I don't know any Arab country. I'd never been before in Muslim countries. I never ever felt that any Israeli ever called me Palestinian. All what they call me, Israeli Arab. So I love being an Arab. I'm so proud to be Arabic. But also the word Israeli, I struggle with it because I, I felt like if I was Israeli, then I would be treated equal. Then I wouldn't really worry what's happening 15 minutes to drive away from my house in West Bank or in Gaza. So it is a problem. And when you say Israel, I mean, if you look at what's happening in Israel, Israel is almost two states in one state. So let's go back and say who we are. We are Palestinians in 1948, when the Nakba happened, 85% of us were forced to leave. And one of the 15% who were left, more than 500 villages were destroyed 
and disappeared off the map. 78% of the land was confiscated and taken. And I was left like to try to rebuild what used to be there. Uh, George, I am not going to sit here and start scoring points and saying this and that. What I'm going to tell you, <clears throat> and possibly you agree with me, I love this country, which is my country. We go back later on, whether we call it Israel or Palestine, but it's Palestine, historically. I love that country because I was born, I know what's the meaning of olive oil. I know what's the meaning of fig. I know the meaning of the city of Jerusalem. But one thing I am not going to accept, being told what to do in my country by settlers, by extremists, by fanatics, by especially the government of Israel now. Whether you believe it, I remember uh, 20 years ago when I was at schools and universities in Israel, in Israel, I always argued with them who came first, like whether the chicken or the egg. We always, who was here? So I showed my Jewish friends that my granddad and my family been in Palestine for the last five, six hundred years. Oh, then they said to me, oh, I've only been here for 20 years, but before that, King David. Then he goes to King Solomon. Then he goes to Abraham. So if we go like that, we could never finish the argument. But all what need to talk now, can we live together? Mm. And what's the answer to that? The answer, we can live together. George, you will not believe if I tell you. The Hebrew language, because I speak Arabic, but I speak Hebrew as a first language. But you know, I control the Hebrew language better than any Jewish from New York, better than any Jewish from London, better than any Jewish from Germany. Hebrew is a language we have no problem with it. Jewish people, I have no problem with them. Jewish people have more in common with the Arabs. There are people than, of the book. The, exactly. We are cousins, allegedly. I don't know why these cousins are not good at the moment, but we are supposed to live together. I remember 20 years ago, we used to have in Israel two sections, left wing and right wing. It was Mabai, Mabam, all these Abayabin, Rabin, Paris. Now in Israel, we don't have a left wing. The only left wing is peace now. It's very small. Shlomit Aloni. So, so the left wing used to be 50% of the population. Now in Israel, the left wing is not even a 20%. This so is because now what of I said mass to... immigration of, uh, of Russians to Israel. Nothing. This has it... changed the political balance. That's, that's one way to look at it. But actually, the Israeli politicians manipulating to be so popular you have to please the settlers. You have to be pleasing the settlers who bring the money from abroad. You have to please the extremists. So everybody was running. So the left wing started running to the center and then they disappeared when Barak so disappeared. And now, whether you believe it, Netanyahu is actually relatively is the left wing in the government, he's the only left wing in the government. I know you laugh. It's the irony that well, it, because it's everybody, a bitter, yeah. uh, irony. You said, and uh, it's important for people to grasp the geography of this. The West Bank is 15 minutes away from you. Yes, they are Palestinians. You are Palestinian. Palestine. You are in one state, and they are in a state of statelessness. Absolutely, it is. True, though, when I first started going to your part of the world, uh, and I, I, I was in Kufar Qasim at least 30 years ago, uh, mm -hmm. that there was no connection then between the people uh, inside the Green Line in Israel and the people 15 minutes away oh, in the occupied territory. George, I love that. Has that changed? Oh, big time. 
I love that you touch on this point. You know, uh, it's very sad that we, the Palestinians who have Israeli passport, we were neglected for so long. We were left alone. From 1948 until 1967, we were under military occupation. And in 1967, Israel moved the army uniforms to West Bank, and they wore civilian clothes, but they still ruled us in a different way. So they ruled the West Bank with bullets, an army, and guns, while with us, they rule us with making law to make our life miserable. So they never, ever, ever in the Israeli government were interested to harmonize the Palestinians together. They never wanted to bring standard of living to make them the same standard. It's the biggest joke I have with my friends when I hear that Israel is a member of the OECD. I mean, it's a joke, like the whole organization that people live the same. So, so Israel created mistrust between us. Oh, these guys, they speak Hebrew. These guys, they're happy here. So they, the media, the racism in the media described us that we almost like different people. But in reality, we are the same. And also, I'm not going to come and praise the Palestinian authorities or any Palestinian leadership. The Arab world neglected us. The Muslim world neglected us. So the Israeli world wanted to destroy us. So we have no intellectual contact. But now, we are financially supporting every single Palestinian city in West Bank or village who struggle financially. We are the protectors of the Al-Aqsa Holy Shrine. Without us, the Al-Aqsa would have been demolished and been abandoned long time ago. Every day, more than five, 600 buses go from the palace because the people in West Bank and Gaza cannot visit Al-Quds. They but they can't stop you from going. But they can't stop us. So what we do, we go and support Al-Quds, and then we started every Saturday and Friday and Sunday, we go and do shopping in West Bank, because these poor guys, after cultivating their agriculture, the Jewish people cannot, don't go there anymore shopping. So we go and do our shoppings in West Bank to help them. We are one nation. Do you have a dream? I would love to live with the Jewish people in this, from the, from the sea to the Jordan River, where every Jewish man can go and exercise his holy duties towards whatever he wants. Christian. So I like when I walk into Jerusalem and I stand outside the wall of Jerusalem, I see a big imam and a big sheikh and a priest playing back gamel together. And when it says Allahu Akbar, then they go each one whatever to do and they come back, continue the ga game with a menti. And I want every Palestinian on the planet to visit the country and to enjoy it. I want every Jewish to come, and I want every Christian to come and do pilgrimage, and I want people to come and feel it's a really holy land. We might not have oil, but we have olive oil. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed for a wonderful, wonderful tour You're of the welcome. Palestinian horizon. And now it's your turn to tell us what you think through the portals of social media. What's rattling, Gayatri? Parliament, has it come to this? Uh, we wanted to know the people's thoughts about the quality of the debates. And Blind Willie McTell says, it doesn't really qualify as debating when MPs simply regurgitate what a spin doctor has told them to say. And Raymond Deloney says, standards have definitely dropped since they allowed TV cameras into the chamber. Now, Jacob would definitely have agreed with that one. <laughs> Live, but not as we know it. What is it like to be for a Palestinian within the Green Line, living within the Green Line? Maggie Allen says, Horrific is what it must be, rather like being a Jew in Nazi Germany. Horrific. Uh, not as bad as that, of course, because uh, Hitler massacred millions of Jews, and that's not true inside uh, Israel. But uh, I think we got some taste today, quite movingly, I felt, 
uh, of you the did. neither fish nor fowl, the lack of identity. And that's all that we've got time for this week. Which, alas, means that's the end of the show. You can stay in touch with us, though, on Twitter at RT underscore Sputnik or on Facebook, Sputnik on Russia Today. It's goodbye from me, Gayatri. And from me, George Galloway. It's been marvellous. 